Good to go? Okay. Hey everyone, thanks for coming to my talk today. Welcome to the second day of B-Sides Philly. There were some great talks yesterday, hopefully there will be some great talks today. Uh, this is a trimmed version of a blog series I did about the subject. Uh, you can find it on steno.ghost.io. It's the only shameless plug I'll have. So uh, that said, let's get started. So first and foremost, our world is not a meritocracy, right? It's not based on fact, merit, or objective reality. Worst yet, this can actually cause something called the backfire effect, where people believe even more strongly in their opinion after you show them the truth. And this has been studied going back, you know, years from Nietzsche to W.I. Thomas. And Nietzsche said, the world is knowable, but it's interpretable otherwise. It has no, not one meaning behind it, but countless meanings. And the Thomas theorem says that if a person perceives a situation as real, then it's real in its consequences. So what these men are saying is that our perceptions have a huge effect on our actions and beliefs, regardless of the objective truth of the situation. So here's the golden rule of social engineering. Abuse self-interest. In fact, in yesterday, in one of the talks, someone asked a question and they said, you know, how can I better motivate my managers, or my employees as a manager? And he said, well, you know, you have to find out what their interest is, and you have to use that to kind of find out what they like and, you know, push them in the right direction. So, the world is often cruel and impersonal, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy, chaotic place. So people often seek comfort, happiness, or confirmation of their own beliefs. And, uh, in fact, um, um, there's a man named uh, Warren who has a one-sentence persuasion, he calls it. And it's summed up as encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions, and throw rocks at their enemies. And when you're gonna do a, when you're trying to con someone, you want to leave good vibrations with people. You don't want them to feel like they got conned, right? You, you, it's almost always a, a positive experience for both parties. And this has been rehashed again, you know, throughout the ages, going back to, you know, the 32nd law of power play to people's fantasy, and it's summed up as, you know, the truth is awfully ugly and avoided, and there's great power in conjuring romance or fantasy to the point where people will flock to you as, you, as if you're an oasis in a desert. And again, rehashed through the ages, Blaise Pascal, if you look at the, the graphic there, when you look at one, you know, the six on the, on the floor there, depending on how you're looking at it and which way you're looking at it, you can see different truths to it. So Blaise Pascal said you don't want to actually directly criticize people. And this was um, echoed again by Dale Carnegie in How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he said that rather than that, you want to convince them by telling them they're right. You want to say, hey, look, I understand your opinion. You're absolutely right. But, you know, if you come over here from my side, you know, maybe you're just not seeing the whole picture. And it's okay. It's much more forgivable to not see the whole picture as opposed to being wrong. People are much less opposed to being, just not seeing everything as opposed to being told, hey, you know, you're an idiot. You didn't see everything, right? So going back to abusing self-interest, we all have this story we tell ourselves. We're, we're storytellers by nature. And we all have a story where we're the protagonist of our own story, right? We all want to see ourselves succeed. We all want to see ourselves make it in the world, right? And it's such a classic question. And in, I hate to be a little cliche, but the classic example is Hitler. You know, he literally thought he was doing good. I mean, he told himself that. I mean, that was, that was his internal story, right? And the road to hell is often paved with good intentions. Now, uh, I actually used this once, and I, my, my goal was I was going on a backpacking trip, and I wanted to take pictures of TSA checkpoints. So when you think of the story of a security guard, you know, they're typically, you know, maybe treated at, at different, indifferent at best, you know, maybe they get some positive interactions, but they're mostly just a pain in the butt, right? So I took along a little stuffed animal with me. And I got some pictures of my phone and I said, you know, oh, I'm just taking this animal with me. I have a, a sick cousin at home who's going to miss me. You know, so I said, would you mind just taking a picture real quick of him, like going through the scanner, you know, maybe hanging out on your shoulder and that. And so when I was taking the pictures, I would say, you know, oh, could you just move just a little bit to the left? And I tried getting like the make and model numbers within the picture of the different devices they had, the security checkpoints and all that stuff. And it, it was cool because they all got that, you know, warm, fuzzy, positive feeling. They got that, like, that genuine, like, oh, I'm helping someone. Not only that, but I also appealed to their ego a little bit. And I said, you know, I had pictures on my phone of the kid dressed up as a cop for Halloween. And I said, you know, he wants to be an FBI or CIA agent when he grows up. And that inherently just appeals to their ego. 
it makes them feel better. It almost makes them feel like, you know, oh, hey, the, you know, little kids look up to me. I'm, I'm doing good, in a sense, you know, because TSA agents, I don't, I don't want to speak too badly about them, but, you know, again, it's a little bit of a security theater. It's, it's just not all that great. So let's move on to wearing masks. So now that you have the, the, the foundation in place, abuse self-interest, the next thing you have to do is learn how to change face you're wearing, right? So what you want to do is suspend your own personality to dissociate yourself from the situation. And we all, we all, we all wear masks naturally. I mean, you show different faces to your significant other, to your coworkers, to your boss when you go out in public. You know, we all have different masks we put on at different times, and it's such a natural part of our reality. It's almost, you know, in a sense, like spinning up a new virtual machine of yourself and sandboxing yourself from the world, if you want to think of it like that. So there's three helpful principles that can help you out here. And the first one is life is just a game. Just aim to improve how well you do, right? And even going back to Shakespeare, all the world's a stage, all the men and women are merely players, right? We're all just here. It's have a good time. Aim to, just aim to do better, right? Don't overthink it, don't overanalyze it, don't worry too much about it. The second one is fake it till you make it. You have to have confidence. You have to have enough confidence to act, but at the same time, you don't want to do things that are too far out of your bounds. So you want to try to balance that and not become too delusional with it. You have to have enough confidence to do it. You have to sell yourself on the lie that you already are the mask that you want to wear. So if you're pretending to be, you know, for instance, a good guy in a charity, right? You have to be able to go through that and, you know, put time in and become that person that, you know, gives all their time to charity and gives money and donates their time, things like that. And again, going back to Nietzsche's perspectivism, you have to deny objective truth. You have to understand that the way people see things could be valid, but they might not actually be true, right? And going back to Blaise Pascal with the six on the ground, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, that can change things. So there's a couple of dangers to wearing masks, unfortunately. Masks tend to lose value once you wear them. So for instance, it's actually not that hard to do, and it's actually pretty much a natural part of our daily interactions, right? You show different faces, of, you know, your significant other, coworkers, et cetera, et cetera, again. So if everyone's doing it, how easy is it to do, number one? And number two, how can I trust other people who are doing it? You know, how do you gain that trust back? It gets a little weird. And I mean, you know, if you think about it, Heath Ledger, the, the very sad situation that happened with him when he, after he played the Joker, you have to wonder just how much he got into that character because he uses a, a style of acting called method acting where you get very empathetic with the character and you try to assume that role as much as you can. So it's one of those things where, you know, just how far did he go into it? There's a, a funny example on my website, um, and it's about a guy named Roofman. And he's a criminal who escaped prison and lived in Toys R Us, okay? And he donated his time to charity. He met a woman. He tried, you know, romancing her, all that. And when the police finally came, she said, you know, I, I can't believe this is true. You know, this can't possibly be true. And it's one of those things where, again, going back to the world's cruel and, cruel and impersonal and people seek out, you know, confirmation of their own beliefs, people will often take abuse or ignore warning signs to keep their delusions going. So, the next part is storytelling. Now, I don't always come off as the most interesting man in the world, but when I do, it's because I told it a good story. Storytelling is an ancient, inherent part of human interaction. It's been going on since basically language was invented. It was the only way of transferring information between two people until writing was invented, really. And there was actually a study done that showed that when you tell a good story, you can actually improve your status or appearances. So women rated men as more attractive. And if you think about it, in a way it makes a lot of sense. Interesting people tell interesting stories. If you don't have an interesting story, well, you're not really that much of an interesting person. Now I saw Kendra Hall speak once, and she boiled it down to a really nice explain it like I'm five type thing. And her explanation was, you have a situation, then there's an explosion, and then you come back. Dan Harmon, from Rick and Morty, Community, all in that, he has an excellent storytelling 101 series on a website, and his general 
overall overarching theory is that stories follow this circular pattern. So, for instance, number one, you either have a character or an idea. Number two, you either desire change or you notice a problem. Number three is a threshold, and that's usually when you finally decide to go. You decide to do it. You decide to take action. Number four is the road of trials. So if you're thinking about, you know, a typical story, that's when, you know, the main character goes and meets his master and trains with him and goes through, you know, all that, you know, ridiculous road of trials type things. Five is meeting the goddess or finding the item that you were looking for. Six is meeting your maker. So once you find what you were looking for, you then have to use it to overcome the problem that you found originally. Seven is the other threshold, and that's returning. That's the road of return. And then finally, at eight, you have to return with change. Stories inherently have this part of it where when you finally come back to it, you have to return with change. And Dan says, he defends his theory when he says something along the lines of, you know, it's just this inbred desire with humans is what's kept our society together. You have to go find, take, and return with change. We were hunter-gatherers for, you know, hundreds of years. So it's one of those things where you couldn't just sit on your butt and wait. You had to go out, you had to find the deer, you had to kill it, you had to bring it back. He also goes on to mention a couple of different psychological things, which I'm not going to get into too much, but the general idea is that you want to be the master of both worlds. And this circle, if you go back to the last one, these two circles are actually the same. So if you think about it, just imagine the one through eight on top of that circle, and the thresholds at three and seven are the, the separations between the conscious and the unconscious world. And Dan says, be the master of both worlds. So if you're giving a presentation, you're doing a sales pitch, you know, whatever it is, if they don't like you, but you seem like you know what you're talking about, that'll have a negative effect on you. So you want to not only be, you know, seem like an expert, but you want to be personable, you want to be likable. You want them to say, hey, not only does this guy sound like he knows what he's talking about, but there's something about him I like. So, a couple of tips. Kendra Hall used this tip where she said, you, you want to provide details in order to get people imagining your story in their head. And one of the ways to do that is she used the example of the old wooden chairs in school. So if she's telling a story, she'll say, you know, remember back in the day when, you know, one, one of these days I was, you know, back in school, I just came back from lunch and recess, and I had to sit in those old, uncomfortable wooden chairs. You guys know the type, right? And as soon as you say that, you instantly start imagining the situation in your head, and that gets you a little bit invested in the situation. It automatically brings out some of your own emotions, some of your own feelings, right? But the problem is you can use a little bit too much detail. You can go you can go overboard with it. So you don't want to use too much, but you want to do enough to get them involved in the situation. You also want to have um, scripts. So you want to have pre-made stories that will build certain profiles of your character. So again, if, if you're a roof man, you're pretending to be a charitable guy, you want to have past experiences and stories where you can say, oh yeah, you know, this one time I stopped on the side of the road and helped some guy change his tire, you know, things. You want to have small little anecdotes like that to make sure that your character meshes. So I'm going to tell you a real quick story here. Back when I was in high school, me and my friend had talked about going skydiving. And you need to be 18 to do it, so we had talked about it for a while, we got it set up. We went, and when I was sitting in the lobby, I was reading a magazine, and in it, there was an article about a 5,000-foot jump in Brazil that had gone terribly wrong. A guy was dressed as Santa Claus, and he was supposed to jump, drop down, and land and give out presents to kids. Unfortunately, he did, his chute never actually deployed, so he just went splat in front of 40 or so kids. How do you explain that to your kid? Not only that, but if you're a skydiving company, why are you putting that in the lobby? That didn't give me a very good feeling. You know what I mean? So despite that, we go back in, we go through training. And the training is that you have to lay a certain way because you have somebody on your back. And if you've never gone skydiving, the way they do it is they tip the plane. So you're literally hanging outside the plane. The dude has his doors, a hand across the door. And then when you finally go, he lets go, and the plane just tips, and you drop. So, you know, through the training, he's saying, oh, you know, we all roll our own parachutes, so you know, there's no worry about that. We don't let someone else do it, so you know, our life is on the line as well as yours. It was very reassuring. On the way up, 
I noticed there was about 20 people in the plane, 10 people jumping total, and then, you know, their, their buddy on the back, so there was 20 people total. And it was a really tiny Cessna plane. While we were going up, I noticed a sign on the plane that said there was a 500 pound limit to the plane. And it, between that and the Santa thing, you know, I'm sitting there looking at it and going, couldn't you have at least taken it down? I'm sure it's okay, it's probably meant for longer flights, but, you know, Jesus Christ, guys, you could have at least taken it down, right? So I'm going on a 10,000 foot jump, and what they don't tell you about skydiving is, is that for 90 seconds, you're free falling at 120 miles per hour. And then all of a sudden, you go to about five miles per hour standing up. Not even lying to you, I got bruises where the straps were. It was that much of a, a jolt. So I finally jumped, going, you know, going, ducking my shoulders, you know, making all sorts of cool rolls and all that from the training that they taught us. And, uh, when I finally went straight, I was sitting like a kangaroo in a pouch almost. It wasn't quite, I wasn't standing, I was in this weird, awkward sitting position because of the way the safety harness was. So the guy looks at me and he says, okay, so loosen your safety harness, stand on my tiptoes, and then slowly move your way up. And I looked at him like, you just told me to untie the only thing keeping me tied to you when you have the parachute. You have to be fucking nuts, right? So I do it anyway, it all works out. I start steering the parachute, get used to that and all that. We finally land. My friend jumped after me. And he, when he landed, the second he landed, he instantly puked. So just to go back to that example, a real quick general rundown of the one through eight steps. The first one, the idea, is that we decided to go. The second part is that, you know, there was the Santa tragedy in the magazine that I read. The third part, is the training that was crossing the threshold. That's the, this is really happening to me, right? The fourth part, the road of trials, was all of a sudden the 500 pound limit. And while we were up there, there was a girl on the plane who started freaking out and they basically told her, look, once you're up, you're up, you're jumping. And that they weren't serious about that, but they were just trying to get her to go through with it. So in five, meeting the goddess, that was actually jumping. Six, overcoming a problem and meeting the maker, that was when the guy told me to untie the only thing t keeping me sustained to him, right? The seventh, the part of coming back with change, was after I had done that, I, I learned, you know, how to steer the parachute, all that good stuff. And then finally, at the end, the returning with change, landing and watching my friend puke. So, the next part. Now that we have abused self-interest, wearing masks, and storytelling down, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to Stanislavski's method acting. And Stanislavski was big on being empathetic and paying attention to the minute details of situations. And he actually said that you should do a lot of research on people to give a true or natural presentation. And he did that through people watching. So for instance, if you're gonna pretend to be a carpenter or a hard laborer, they're not gonna have clean clothing, right? They're gonna have mud on their boots, paint splatters, they're gonna have calloused hands. You have to be aware of those things so that in case you get questioned about them, you're prepared so that you can kind of, you know, mitigate the concerns a bit. And he even said that you should practice blending in your downtime. And it's a good way to do things because then you can practice in situations where you might not necessarily have a lot on the line. So, for instance, one of the ways I did this was I hung out at a local airport and I started um, talking to the pilots, just general elicitation, asking them about their job, pretending that I was interested in possibly becoming one. And for those of you that don't know, there's a term called squawking. And squawking is this way of pilots um, just explain different situations. For instance, there's a Squawk 7500. There was a recent meme made about it. And it's a, uh, it's a terrorist hijacking warning, Squawk 7500. And so that's one of those, it's one of those things where you have to understand the lingo and the jargon, right? You have to do that people watching. You have to pay attention to the details. And then after a little while, I started pretending that I was a, pli a pilot and I would talk to other people in the bar and just make it seem like I was a pilot, right? So part of method acting is connecting the mental to the physical. So Stanislavski said that, you know, if, you're if your character is supposed to be cold, you should be shivering at all times. You should be rubbing your hands, you know, maybe blowing into them. Or for the, you know, less classy people, maybe sliding them down your pants, right? That, that always keeps them warm, you know? And then there's the second question is the magic if. And the magic gift says, you know, if I were my character, what would I be thinking? 
What would they be thinking? And again, the entire idea is to empathize as much as you can with the character that you're trying to play. Now, the given circumstance. For those who don't know, there's a, a funny historical fact where uh, Kansas City used to have brothel inspectors. And that right there is their badge. Just funny history tip for you. But so what you have to do with the given circumstances, it says you have to accept your context as valid. So if you're an inspector, there's certain things that go along with being an inspector, like you have to have a badge or some sort of official, you know, way of showing yourself as an inspector. So if you're going to pretend to be one, you have to be aware of that and you have to accept it. You can't just try moving around it. So that you'd have to, you know, try saying, oh, I lost it, or you'd have to try making your own, you know, something like that. So the next part is imagination. And it's very similar to, you know, taking a swing and the way sports players imagine it. You don't, you're never going to have the full story about your own character, so you have to look for clues in the context of what you do have. And Stanislavski said some of the big questions to focus on were who you are, where you're going from, wh where you're going, why, what your goals are, and what do you want to do when you get there. Now, you can also create your own stories. You know, using Dan Harmon's storytelling, right? So, for instance, if you're trying to be a charitable person, or at least seem like one, then you're going to have to start creating stories so that you have something to tell people, so that, you know, it builds your character in their head. The next part is circles of attention. And Stanislavski used this to remain calm about situations. And he said that you should, incre in you should in increase your focus on one thing and create a circle of attention between you and either a person or an object. We often have this spotlight we shine on ourselves, right? This, we beat ourselves up mentally over the smallest, stupidest things. And oftentimes, no one cares about the small stuff. No one sweats it. But we do. So if you create a very intimate circle of attraction with one or two other people, then it prevents you from doing that to yourself because it's hard to do that when you're actively worrying about interpreting their reactions, their body language, you know, we have one-track minds in a sense. You, you can't overload it, right? So it just kind of takes the, the spotlight off, your, off yourself and puts it on something else. So communion. Stanislavski said that you have to be aware of not only your surroundings, but of the other actors and cast members. And so, for instance, if you're trying to argue with Walter about going over the line and marking it zero, you have to know what kind of person he is. He's not going to take that. He's not going to accept that. That's just going to be something he pushes back on. And again, it's one of those things where you have to keep the inner story in mind, you know, that we all have an internal narrative about ourselves. And you have to keep that in mind and try to use that against people because, again, the best way to, to manip manipulate people is abusing self-interest generally. You also have to keep in mind what your long-term goals versus your short-term goals are. So, for instance, you know, not everyone tells their whole story at once, right? I mean, even, you know, you watch TV shows or a movie, they have subplots and, you know, overarching, you know, general plots, things like that. So the next part is doing a little bit more advanced people watching. So what you want to do is you want to look at the fine details, but instead of just looking at one person and studying them, you want to try looking at groups. Try finding their hierarchy, their status symbols, the norms, taboos, things like that. And there's a, a CTF awareness game where you can play it with the two or more people. You can do it by yourself, but it's easier with two people. And the idea is to pick things out from a situation to remember. So if you're going into a coffee shop, you say, okay, well, let's try to remember, you know, something about the cashier. And then you'll ask, you show your questions, and you'll say, well, what kind of necklace did she have? What color were her clothes? You know, how did she stand? Did she seem confident? Did she seem happy? Things like that. Now, I like extending this, and uh, when I go to into stores, and really anywhere, I'll try looking for cameras, infrastructure points, you know, alarms, electrical boxes, network access ports, routers, things like that, ingress, egress spots, guard patrols, heavily trafficked areas, places to avoid, things like that. So abusing the information age. This is about OSINT, and there's a, a framework um, that is, it's, really, it's really cool, it's by um, Justin Nardone, I think his name is, and uh, it shows just, a list all the publicly available data sources. So for instance, people search engines like Spokio.com. You can go in there and you can search for people's names, phone numbers, things like that, and it'll bring up information about them. There's different review sites, Glassdoor.com, RateMyProfessor.com, things like that. There's even third-party sites, 
snoops to IBM's Watson for text analysis, things like that. There's also contact trading, data.com. Data.com takes, you know, corporate contact information. You can create a free account, and the way it works is when you trade data to them, you upload contact information, you can then download more. There's also professional sites, such as IDI Core, LexisNexis, stuff like that. And uh, Tracy, actually, she mentioned a couple of these, like Pacer, public records, things like that. So the ways that you can become a pro if you don't necessarily have access, you can just buy a cheap domain, right? Buy a cheap domain, name it whatever you want, make it, you know, a business name, maybe build up a fake website around it, stuff like that. It'll make you seem more legitimate when you try doing things. You can also try incorporating yourself, right? Just become an LLC. It's not that hard, it's not that risky. You know, a little bit of a gray area, but you can definitely do it. And you might even be able to, you know, social engineer these data brokers from IDI Core and LexisNexis because they don't deal with the average Joe type customer. You might even be able to get them to just work with you solely just by having a legitimate looking email domain and a website, right? Or you could also try, you know, maybe doing contract work or side work with a private investigation firm or something like that, right? Maybe just one day a month or something. It'll get you access to, to more information, more details about people. Another good way to go about this is industrial espionage. espionage. And it's basically, you know, you can apply for a job somewhere, and even though it might not be what you're trying to get information about, so for instance, if you apply for a low-level job at some company, just working there and paying attention to, you know, the details and the background information can get you a lot. You can identify prime targets. So for instance, one of the best people to target are HR and personal secretaries. HR often has access to information that no one else, even, even IT might not have access to, right? Not only that, but secretaries often run their, their VIP's entire life, right? They have account numbers, they have passwords, they have, you know, basically they, they literally run their life most, like nine times out of ten. It's crazy to think about, but that's really the way it is. And again, you can look at, you know, corporate reviews like Glassdoor, so you can get information on, say, the way a, man, a certain manager runs their shop. So that if you're trying to fish someone, you can say, oh yeah, you know how manager, you know, ex-manager is, they're, they're so overbearing and impatient, you know what I mean? Y you can do stuff like that. You can also go to, you know, just the corporate website or Facebook. You can use LinkedIn. There's a, a tag on LinkedIn called the Lion Tag, which stands for LinkedIn Open Networking. And that essentially means if you follow me, I follow back. Open networking. It's crazy. Then there's actually pictures of people's employee badges on LinkedIn. There, there's all kinds of crazy stuff you can find on LinkedIn. So level up your perception. And this helps not only with, you know, OS and, um, OSINT and all that other stuff, but it also helps with, so for instance, I was on a, a trip just a little while ago. And while I was on the trip, I, uh, I was sitting next to the CFO of, a, of some music company in, from San Francisco or something, and he was drafting an email, and he was hiring a new manager. And it had very detailed information about the benefits package, the salary, and he was sending it out to his team saying, you know, does this sound like a good deal, do you think we could, you know, hire this guy at this rate, stuff like that. And so what I did was, I went to take a window shot, and I got his computer in the scene to get an idea of not only the way he types, but also his signature. So that way I could re reproduce it later if I wanted. I wasn't going to, but it was just one of those things where I was doing it just to kind of practice. So in order to, to train your perception, there's this thing I call, like called peripheral markers. And that's where you tie an object in your peripheral vision with an event that happens along the path. So let's say you're walking down the aisle in a store. And what I like to do is tie camera locations, guard locations, patrols, things like that, to a certain part, like end of aisles, maybe there's like a, a small cubby hole between the shelves or something like that. Try to pick things that won't change in the background. It's never going to be 100% certain because things change all the time, but, you know, do your best. So now that we have all that in place, we move on to the next part, which is forcing attraction and trust. And there was a study by Dr. Arthur Aaron where he said that mutual vulnerability fosters closeness. But it's a bit more like, it's a bit more than that. It's about sustained, escalating, reciprocal, personalistic self-disclosure. Disclosure. And he goes through a couple of set questions and it's a bit like boiling a frog in water. So you start out very generic, asking just general questions about someone trying to just show interest in them, just very basic. And then all of a sudden you start opening up more, then they start opening up more, and then you just keep snowballing that to the point where you can almost make it like a, a, a soulmate type of situation. 
If you've ever heard someone say, oh, you know, I met him that first day and all, you know, I felt like I've known him my entire life. This really describes that situation and that's what you are trying to aim to get, right? Now the other thing is that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to match them on everything. In fact, it's actually a little creepy and it might even be detrimental. Because if you think, there's a thing called the hairy arm technique where a, a, um, a graphic designer figured out that, you know, for really picky clients, they always have to find something wrong with it. So the way he would get around it was, is he would put a, you know, a picture of his, uh, you know, just a little bit of his arm in there. And he would say, and then the client would point it out and go, oh, what's that? Get rid of that and then it's good. They had to find something, they had to pick at something, and he used that against them. So here's a couple of the sample questions. Um, the first three there from the first set, you know, do you want to be famous? What's your perfect, what's your perfect day? Find three things in common with someone. And the next two, what's a dream of yours? What's your ideal friendship? Right? Those are a little more personal. And it's, again, going back to that whole slowly boil the frog in water effect. There's also this thing called mirroring or rapper, uh, rapport building. And, uh, it's automatic. It's almost unconscious with people we like. So when we're focusing on someone, let's say I'm, I'm focusing on you right here. If I were, you know, interested in you or paying attention to you, I would mimic your body language in a sense, right? And you can use this against people to check and test if they're actually interested in you. So if you're out at a bar and there's this girl you like or whatever, you're making eye contact, etc. If you, you know, scratch your head or put out your phone or, you know, lean a certain way. If she, you know, mimics that in a sense, then it's obvious she's paying attention to you. And you can use that also, let's say you're worried about someone tailing you in a car. Start making turns, you know, left, right, you know, just go random ways, but randomly use your turn signal. And pay attention in the rearview mirror and see if they're doing the same thing. Because if they're intently watching you, they're most likely unconsciously mimicking you. So the final part of the talk, and this is going to be uh, the majority of the talk actually, is Colonel John Boyd's OODA loop. And he was a USA, he was a, a Air Force pilot, and his nickname was 42nd Boyd. And that was the amount of time it took him to win a dogfight. So he studied strategists, you know, from present day all the way going back to Sun Tzu. And he said that we live in a world of constant change. And funny enough, it's actually backed up by science between Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, the second law of thermodynamics, things like that. It, we really do live in a world of constant change. And even certain philosophers and spiritual leaders over the years have said similar things. And the OODA loop describes the process, our natural process for learning and decision making. So the first part, and I'm just going to go over this real quick, change in coherence, is that uh, you want to keep your mental models open. Because if you have a very opinionated, closed mindset, entropy will inherently build in your system, right? Things constantly change. You can't afford to have a static belief in something. Because when you do, you instantly discredit it, right? But if you have an open model, you can at least say, okay, well, maybe that's the case. I should at least check, right? Just to make sure I'm not wrong, because I could be wrong. And this helps keep your models, again, very low entropy. And one of the things about this is that uh, pain typically clots around stagnation and avoidance of change, right? Usually when we're having problems with something, when we're having a hard time dealing with something, it's because we're not moving through change effectively. And this goes back to a, even Buddha said similar things. And you can use this in conjunction with the inner story and abusing self-interest. There's great power in identifying people's capacity for change, or perhaps the amount of unfiltered reality they can take. And that's even, um, again, rehashed by Robert Greene in his 48th Law of Power. So, how do you use this? Well, the idea is to heal their pain. And Viktor Frankl was a psychologist, and he had a, an incredible example about this, where a doctor came to him and said, you know, my wife just died, I'm having a really hard time getting over it, what can you do for me? How, how can you help me? And Fr Frankel said, you know, well, rather than tell him anything, I just asked him a question. What would have happened if you had died first? And he said, oh, well, this would have been horrible. She would have had to survive me. She would have suffered so much, et cetera, et cetera. And so Frankel came back and he said, well, you know, you realize that you saved her that pain at the cost that you now have to survive her. And after hearing that, the doctor just walked right out. When you give 
pain a meaning, such as the sacrifice of saving someone else, it oftentimes heals it. Not only that, but um, Venkatesh Rao is a, a blogger, thinker, things like that, and he has this idea called subtractive synthesis. And he says that we can often create power by removing unpleasant things from people's lives, un from the static of their lives. And he says that, you know, this is one thing's, this is one thing that conspiracy theorists, things like that, typically don't get. It's much easier to remove something from reality than it is to manufacture a fake reality. There's less work involved, and it's also oftentimes more effective and easier. So this is Boyd's loop, and it's maybe a little small, a little hard to read, but there's four steps to it. Observe, orient, decide, and act. And it's not exactly a, a one-way thing. It's more of a continuous process, a constant state of change as the world around you changes. So just a, a quick overview here. The observe part is meant to keep systems low entropy, right? It's that allowing information into your mental models, keeping entropy low and adapting to change. Orientation is the most important part, and it's mostly judgment and pattern recognition. And pattern recognition often trumps the amount of information you have. So no matter how much information you have, it might not be that helpful if you can't notice the patterns in the information. Deciding is just selecting a, a best educated guess or a hypothesis. You know, you have to start somewhere and you have to test something, and then you have to change that and tweak it and orient it as you go. And then act is just putting the decision into action and calibrating as necessary. So observation. Again, you want to observe your surroundings, keep your mental models low entropy. And there's a Jeff Cooper's color code, and it's often reflected in many martial arts schools. Boyd, and Boyd said the same thing. He said that you want to remain relaxed but aware. And for Jeff Cooper's color code, that's the yellow stage. That's relaxed but aware. Minimum acceptable level when in public or carrying a firearm. This is what you should be in almost always unless you, you feel very safe, like let's say you're at home trying to go to sleep, something like that. So there's some pitfalls, unfortunately, though. We often lack relevant information, right? We, not, we don't always have all information about the situation going on. Not only that, but if we have too much information and we don't have good pattern recognition, it's hard to remove the noise from the situation. So orientation. This is the most important part of Boyd's loop. And it shapes not only the current loop, but also your, your future loops and your future orientation. So it affects all of your future actions, essentially. And he says it's a complex set of filters and lenses and heuristics that shape our observations and resulting reactions. And it, it's a little bit similar to the various cognitive biases that we have. There's a lot of them. If you go on Wikipedia and look them up, there's a lot of them. And you should get to know all of them. But uh, Boyd also mentioned this. And he mentioned a couple of ones such as tradition, prior experiences, new information, generic heritage. Those are all fairly self-explanatory. And there's also um, two, two prominent psychologists, uh, Gary Klein and uh, Daniel Kahneman. And they put out a 2009 paper where it explained two different processes of decision making. But the, what they meant to do was contrast their views. And what they actually did was just show two different ways that we do it. So Klein's version was naturalistic decision making, NDM. And Kahneman was heuristics and biases. And NDM says that, you know, we mostly rely on past experiences and storytelling and, you know, the power of metaphor, mental stimulation within our own mind to be able to kind of keep that information available and accessible. And Kahneman said that, well, you know, what we really end up doing is just we make shortcuts. We make mental shortcuts. So we say, you know, if we see someone who's short, they might have Napoleon complex. They're maybe a little sensitive, you know? So the most important part of the orientation, I mentioned filters. And the, two, the most important filter is analysis and synthesis. So analysis is studying a whole by looking at its individual parts. It's basically destruction. You take a whole, you break it down, and you look at its individual pieces. Synthesis, on the other hand, is the opposite. It's where you take little bitty pieces and you use that to create a whole by combining the many parts together. And this is similar to Fichte and Hegel's uh, thesis, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And what that says is that you're supposed to take a proposition, instantly negate it, so you say, you know, the sky's blue. Well, no, it's not. And then you find the common ground, you find the common truths behind the two situations, you synthesize them as best you can, and then you start the process over. 
And again, this is all about keeping your mental models low entropy. So when learning new theories, new techniques, new tactics, things like that, don't just trust them. Rigorously test them, right? Because what works for you might not work for me, right? So use this thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and say, okay, well, here's something. Here's the opposite. W what happened? How'd it go? How'd it work? And this is similar to uh, overcoming functional fixedness. And functional fixedness is a bias that says we typically only use tools in ways that they're meant to be used. So, for example, one of the things would be, you know, if the only thing you, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, right? And, you know, SQL injections, um, type confusions, things like that, not validating user input, things like that. If you don't expect someone to input a string into the, into the username field, then you're not validating your input and, you know, SQL injection at this point in 2016 is pretty much negligence, right? But that's using a tool in the way it wasn't supposed to be used. And this show of hands, how many people played with Legos or still play with Legos? Most of the people, right? It's very similar. You can either, you can follow the build pattern or you can take the tools and all the pieces and make your own you know, whatever, follow your imagination. You can make your own, you know, vehicles, you can make your own buildings, you know, whatever it is you're doing. And Boyd used a similar example where he took individual pieces off of, like, um, there was a, an instance of a, a tread on a snowmobile, things like that, and he used all these pieces and brought them together to create something new. But essentially, it's easier to think of it as just playing with Legos, really. So finally, we get to decide and act. So when you're going to decide, it's basically, again, just picking a best educa educated that guess or hypothesis to test. And we often, there's, there's two ways of really doing it. Well-defined procedure versus poorly defined procedure. Well-defined procedure is things like statistics, probabilities, rules of thumb, things like that. And that represents Kahneman's heuristics and biases, right? The second is poorly defined, where we have little or no procedure, we have tight time frames, we, we have a gross lack of information, things like that. And that's the naturalistic decision making of Klein. There's also a thing called A-B testing where you take the same theory or strategy, you put a slight twist on it, and then you see how that twist affects it. It's often used in marketing. And it's also used, for example, in canary trapping. And canary trapping is where you put out different versions of the same story to find a leak. So you say, you tell one person, okay, well, the other day I was, you know, driving along a certain road and something happened. And you tell them a different road, and you tell that to six different people, and then all of a sudden you tell each different person a, a different story, and then when that story leaks, you know which person it was that told it. It's also used in the music industry. Um, I was a, a DJ for a while, as InfoSec people often are for some strange reason, and uh, the music industry uses this. They'll put a high-pitched frequency noise into their songs, and their stem, their stem tracks. Uh, a song is made, made up of uh, you know, various different parts, remix sections, right? And so they'll put these high frequency noises in and they'll put sl you know, slightly different ones and then if those stems leak, then all of a sudden they know who to fire, right? Because you're not supposed to be leaking their proprietary information. So how do we use this? How is it helpful? Well, the first way is resetting a target's loop. So time is usually an important factor. And if you can complete your OODA cycle faster, it allows for more cycles and a better orientation. If you can't find weakness in someone, then you have to create it. And again, the idea is to catch people off guard, and it sends them back to observation phase, right? If you catch someone off guard, they, they take a step back, they don't act, right? So, also, actions can become outdated, and as they become outdated, your advantage increases exponentially, right? Now, there's a couple of drawbacks to it. Sometimes it's more advantageous to wait, but that doesn't mean you be inactive. So, for instance, if you're in a war with another country, you're not necessarily going to go to war yet, but what you want to do is send your fighter jets out to the edge of their airspace, and then you can record their magnitude, the response magnitude and their response times. So you're going to see, oh, they're going to see someone coming in, so they're going to have to send an escort out to defend their border, so then you can kind of test and, pro and probe for weaknesses and errors and things like that. The second part is abusing knee-jerk reactions. So the, one of the problems with um, resetting someone's loop is that you can force them to act by accident. So if you're probing a country and trying to, you know, send your fighter jets out to see their response times, they might shoot you down. It, it could just be something that happens. 
So if you know what their knee-jerk reaction to a situation is, you can use that against them. So um, Robert Greene, again, one of his laws of power is, you know, find people's thumbscrew. Find the thing that really aggravates them and ticks them off and use that against them because then you'll know how they'll react. And you can abuse that, you know, knee-jerk reaction as it is if you know what it's going to be. And you can use OSINT clues, you can abuse, you know, the various cognitive biases, things like that. So the next, most of you are probably familiar with this, honeypots, right? Traps and distractions. I mean, you can have a honeypot server, you know, things, things of that nature. You guys are probably pretty familiar with it. But going back to knee-jerk reactions, if you know what someone's reaction gonna, is going to be, you can actually bait them. You can use a pattern. You can just do the same pattern, you know, three or four times, and then when they move to counter it because they think they know the pattern, you can break it and counter back. So, for example, you know, in InfoSec, maybe having a virtual machine where you save the wrong passwords in your browsers on the form data, right? So that they think they try to rip your form data out, they try to get your password, and all of a sudden you have the wrong one saved in there and they can't do it, use it, right? Or maybe, you know, having a, a fake passwords.txt file on your desktop where you have, you know, all your account names and passwords listed, but none of them are actually right. The fourth one is adding constraints to people's loop. And this is used often in sales with limited time offers, only available for so long, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you want to do is use strategies that will take too long for people to actually verify. So, for example, if I'm fishing for passwords, you know, you can use some, do some OSINT, you know, maybe go on LinkedIn, maybe go to their corporate Facebook, and let's say they call their IT department the ITB, Information Technology Branch, instead of the IT department, right? So when you call someone, you can say, you know, hey, Steve, it's, I, it's, it's Steve from ITB. I'm doing some work on your computer after hours. What's your username and password? And adding that little bit of jargon, adding that little bit of validity to the conversation will often be enough to convince people, especially if they don't have a lot of time to verify the fact, right? I mean, not everyone, if you're sitting in a call center, you're not just going to, you know, call IT or look up the company directory and say, oh, who the hell is this Steve from ITB, right? And the final part, and this is really the most powerful method, and it stand, it's, um, it's promoting chaos. And Boyd describes this as exhausting or overloading your targets by fighting a war of attrition with their willpower, stamina, or ability to react in time. And the ODA, o, the ODA cycle is more than just simply complete your cycles faster. And it's also not a one-way loop, right? You're constantly changing. You're constantly reorienting yourself based on the interaction with the environment. And so Boyd describes it as observe, orient, decide, and act more inconspicuously, more quickly, and with more irregularity. Generate uncertainty, confusion, disorder, and panic, and chaos to shatter cohesion, produce paralysis, and bring about collapse. So if you think of a, a generic sports example, if you think of, you know, soccer or basketball, a guy doing a quick series of dribbles so the defense doesn't know where he's going to go, and then all of a sudden kicking it off, you know, to the left, that creates chaos. It creates, he doesn't know what he's happening. He's constantly stuck in the observation phase. They don't know what to do. And again, same thing with basketball. And one of the ways that, you know, you could use this is to avoid fingerprinting. So browser fingerprinting, operating system fingerprinting, things like that. If you're constantly using different browsers, different size monitors, different hardware, it's very hard to, to nail you down as, you know, oh, this is definitely this X and X hacker, right? And so, presentation is basically over here, and if you look at the, the overarching structure of my presentation, it actually follows Dan Harmon's storytelling example. So the first part is the idea, abuse self-interest, right? The second part is encountering a problem, wearing masks, changing your face, the dangers involved with that, right? The third part, crossing the threshold, is storytelling, being able to tell effective stories, get people, you know, really believing your character. The fourth part, the road of trials, is the method acting. Going out, practicing in your downtime, doing people watching, going out, doing the OSINT, all that kind of stuff. The fifth part is the, the abusing the information age, the industrial espionage, targeting HR and secretaries, things like that. That's finding the goddess, right? That's finding the way to overcome your problems. The sixth part is using it. And the sixth part was trust and mirroring, right? The mutual vulnerability fosters closeness part. And then finally, coming back with change. The seventh part was the OODA cycle. And then the eighth, the final, the final part is actually using and abusing the OODA part. So I sincerely hope you feel as though you're returning with change. I hope you learned something. Uh, thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the day.
Any questions? Comments, concerns? Okay. 